the blonde bombshell from We've Got It May. Terry Copley signs up for the role of a lifetime. And the whole room said, you're hired. Plus, this family cashed out. Now I know what it really means to be faithful. To go all in. Why are you doing this? What are you doing? Their story on today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. It may be called the speech of the century. It really was a bombshell. And now we understand, uh, frankly, if if we reversed it and needed Netanyahu could win the presidency of the United States, I don't know how he's doing in Israel, but I think it gave him a boost. But what he said was so poignant when he said that, you know, the Jews for so many years had no place to go. They had no place to hide, and they were at the mercy of, of their oppressors. And he said, no more. And I think that's the rallying cry that we all realize, that this man was talking for the survival of his nation against an imperfect deal. And uh, he warned of a nuclear nightmare. Uh, and he said it could happen if Iran gets a nuclear bomb and is free to do it. But <clears throat> the Obama plan won't stop radical Islam uh, from going nuclear. Netanyahu delivered his warning to a joint meeting of Congress, but as David Brody reports, the president and many Democrats didn't want to hear it. The Prime Minister of Israel, His Excellency Benjamin Netanyahu. Applause and criticism greeted Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu before a controversial appearance in front of Congress. More than 50 Democrats stayed away, some because of upcoming elections in Israel, others because they felt Republican leaders snubbed the White House by inviting the prime minister without any notice. President Obama didn't even watch the speech. This didn't help the rocky relationship between the two leaders. But the prime minister took the high road, opening with praise for the president. Some of what the president has done for Israel might never be known because it touches on some of the most sensitive and strategic issues that arise between an American president and an Israeli prime minister. But I know it, and I will always be grateful to President Obama for that support. The main tension deals with Iran's nuclear program. In leading the negotiations, the U.S. is pushing to downgrade, but not eliminate Iran's ability to make nuclear weapons. Netanyahu told Congress it's the wrong strategy. This deal has two major concessions. One, leaving Iran with a vast nuclear program. And two, lifting the restrictions on that program in about a decade. That's why this deal is so bad. According to the deal, not a single nuclear facility would be demolished. Thousands of centrifuges used to enrich uranium would be left spinning. Thousands more would be temporarily disconnected, but not destroyed. The White House has repeatedly said that they want a nuclear-free Iran. They just think that negotiations are the way to get there. Yet even White House officials admit that an actual deal with Iran on nuclear weapons is 50-50 at best. But after the prime minister's speech, the president questioned a lack of solutions on Netanyahu's part. On the core issue, which is how do we prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, which would make it far more dangerous and would give it scope for even greater action in the region, uh, the prime minister didn't offer any viable alternatives. Add to the speech White House concern that Congress might pass additional sanctions against Iran. The negotiations are at a sensitive stage, and this strong argument couldn't come at a worse time for deal makers. If anyone thinks, if anyone thinks this deal kicks the can down the road, think again. When we get down that road, we'll face a much more dangerous Iran a Middle East littered with nuclear bombs, and a countdown to a potential nuclear nightmare. 
Republican Senator Ted Cruz says the president's role of pacifist in chief is chiefly to blame for Israel's situation. Do you believe he dislikes, first of all, Netanyahu? Do you believe he has antagonism towards Israel? Undoubtedly. Uh, On both it, 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 it is heartbreaking. This administration has been the most hostile U.S. administration to hit to Israel in the history of our country. And Cruz has harsh words for Democrats who didn't show up for the speech. David, I'll tell you this. No friend of Israel would boycott a speech by the elected leader of Israel, particularly at a time of enormous peril. Those words, enormous peril, are ones echoed by Netanyahu. His people remember the Holocaust, and he's determined to never let anything like that happen again. I can guarantee you this. The days when the Jewish people remain passive in the face of genocidal enemies, those days are over. I can promise you one more thing. Even if Israel has to stand alone, Israel will stand. But I know that Israel does not stand alone. I know that America stands with Israel. I know that you stand with Israel. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. You know, <clears> that was said, and I say it again, in order to make a deal, you have to have an honest negotiating partner. There has to be somebody on the other end of the table who will keep his word. The Iranians lie, and that's part of their statecraft, is lying is part of the way they deal. Now, look what they've done. First of all, they have established a state that is a theocracy. It has taken away the rights of citizens. It has abused their people. Uh, they have had uh, tremendous uh, offenses against the civil rights of their own people. Secondly, they have been the main sponsors of terror all around the world. They backed Hezbollah in Lebanon. They have backed Hamas in the Gaza. They have backed the uh, rebel states uh, in uh, the uh, Yemen area that overthrew the, uh, the elected official of the, of the country of uh, Yemen and have established what looks like an Iranian-sponsored uh, uh, Muslim dictatorship. They have planted countless IEDs in the pathway of our soldiers uh, in Iraq and have killed thousands of them. They have also been involved in attacks on uh, embassies around the world. They are without question the leading sponsor of terrorism. And what they believe, <clears throat> you must get it right, they believe in the theology, the eschatology of a final collapse of civilization that will only be stopped at the emergence of the Messiah they call the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, who will then begin to rule the entire world. And Jesus Christ, according to what they believe, will come back and acknowledge that Muhammad is God's representative on earth. And he now will say, I was a mistaken when I defended the Jews. Now I want to kill the Jews. Now that's what they believe. They also believe that before the Mahdi comes, there has to be an elimination of Israel, has to be an elimination of Christians. There has to be a bloodbath throughout the world. They believe that. That's at their core belief. Do you think for one minute that they're going to give up their nuclear ambitions? Of course not, because it's at the core of what they believe. And so for our negotiators to go in thinking that these people are going to keep their word, this is nonsense. They will cheat every chance they've got. And you tell me whether it'll be possible for international inspectors to get the way to Natanz or their other places where they're enriching uranium and inspect their facilities and their centrifuges, it will not happen. So we should heed the warning of my good friend, Bibi Netanyahu, because he's telling us the truth. And uh, for the Democrats, the number of them to not to show up, it was an affront. And I think that in terms of politics in America, this should be a game changer in terms of what uh, party the Jewish people support henceforth. Well, in other news, 
Could Obamacare be on life support after a challenge at the Supreme Court taking place today? John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau. Here's John. Thanks, Pat. The president's health care law faces what could be its toughest legal challenge yet. And if the White House loses this case, some experts predict it could severely cripple the law and eventually cause it to unravel. Dale Hurd has the story. Four words could doom the entire 2,000-page Affordable Care Act on a technicality. Those words to be argued before the court today are established by the state. Opponents say the law required individual states to create their own health care exchanges. But 34 states chose not to do that. So the Obama administration created a national health care exchange. If the court decides that violates the law, five to seven million Americans might not be eligible to get subsidies from the federal government to buy health insurance. If the court were to rule that the administration's interpretation was wrong, then there are 34 states where people would no longer be able to get these tax credits for buying coverage on the exchange. And if those subsidies went away, experts say Obamacare could crumble because only the sickest people would join exchanges and premium rates would skyrocket. Lawyers for the government will argue against a literal interpretation of the law, saying the intent is clearly to help people in all 50 states get affordable health care coverage. There is breast cancer in my family, so for me it was very important to get the affordable care um, so that I could go and get all of my preventive care. After narrowly surviving a constitutional challenge in 2012, the fate of Obamacare is once again in the hands of nine justices. Some Republicans say either way, they'll keep working to repeal the law. It's bad for patients, bad for the providers, the nurses and doctors who take care of them, and terrible for taxpayers. This is just one more example of a law that has had all sorts of unintended consequences and adverse effects for all sorts of people. The Supreme Court's decision is expected to come down in June. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Thanks, Dale. And Pat, a lot hangs in the balance here. Well, again, the people who were selling, Jonathan Gruber, who had written the law and was selling the law, said it's not a tax. It is not a tax. The Obama said it is not a tax. It isn't a tax. So when it got to the Supreme Court, the question was, did the Congress, uh, under the Commerce Clause, have the power to regulate anything as, as diffuse as the relationship between a patient and his doctor. So Chief Justice Roberts bypassed that, and he said, well, it isn't Commerce Clause. It is a tax, and the Congress has the power to tax. Well, Obama had said it wasn't a tax. Gruber had said it wasn't a tax. They had told everybody it wasn't a tax. Now, Roberts comes out and says it's a tax, and that's what saved the law. Now it's coming back to him again, and he's pretty much a strict constructionist, and the construction says these, th these benefits will be given to people in health care exchanges established by a state. Well, they have not been established by states. They've been established now by the president. And, and oh, Roberts, he's got to come down on the side of the law. And that means we'll have a five to four decision. The liberals on the court are going to go with Obama, but you've got four who will go against it. So Roberts will be the, the, the swing vote, and it's going to depend on those words. But they have to construe the clear meaning of the law established by the state. That's what the law says. And what they can say, if you don't like it, you can change it. So go back and change it. And then you've got a back to the House and the Senate, which is controlled by the Republicans, and they won't change it. Therefore, the major portion of the law that, uh, will crumble. That's what will happen. And I don't believe that John Roberts is going to vote to say, well, we're going to ignore the clear language of the statute and make up our own. He isn't that kind of a judge. At least I hope not, John. Pat, the House has voted to fund the Department of Homeland Security for the rest of the year, ending a dramatic standoff involving President Obama's executive action to protect millions of illegal immigrants from being deported. Republicans had wanted to use the funding bill to prevent the orders from taking effect, but Democrats successfully blocked their attempts. Some Republicans said House Speaker John Boehner caved, while others said 
he made the right move. The Islamic State released four more Syrian Christians from the more than 200 hostages they kidnapped in Syria last week. The Assyrian rights group Demand for Action and the Assyrian Charitable Association say the reasons for their release were unclear. Earlier this week, ISIS released 19 Christian hostages after they paid an Islamic tax for non-Muslims. ISIS still has at least 190 Assyrian Christians it's holding captive. Well, the United States has an oil problem. We have too much of it. The U.S. has so much crude oil that it's running out of places to put it. And that could drive oil and gasoline prices even lower in the months ahead. The U.S. has been producing and importing an average of a million more barrels of oil every day than what it's using. That extra crude is going into storage tanks and it's pushing U.S. supplies to their highest point in the last 80 years, according to the Department of Energy. If this keeps up, storage tanks could reach their limits by the middle of April, and that could send the price of oil and gas down even more, with some experts saying oil could go as low as $20 a barrel. Pat, I'm sure no complaints there from consumers. I wouldn't think so. Um, I read, uh, uh, you know, one of the experts analyzing what would happen to the Saudis, and that would be about their bottom line, that they could, they could stand the pain down to $20 a barrel, but in the process, they would uh, take out the shale producers in America, and they would also take out probably Nigeria. They would take out Venezuela. They would take out uh, the tar sands up in Canada, et cetera. And then they would have a free shot to go ahead and raise the prices back up again for OPEC. But uh, we have some laws, and I'm not as conversant with it as I should be, that prohibits us from a lot of exporting of our, law, of our crude. If the Congress would change the law and let the uh, producers, uh, the free market, take effect, we could begin to uh, uh, export into the uh, uh, international marketplace, and it would balance things out. And certainly, we could stop importing oil. If we've got so much of our own, uh, we could uh, buy our own. But in any event, uh, there is a real chance that when this happens, there's going to be a tremendous shakeout of oil companies. Um, the so-called E&P, the um, Exploration and Production Group of oil companies, uh, will be, you know, gasping and hurting big time. John? Pat, he's a former Attorney General of the United States. He served as the 50th governor of the state of Missouri and a former senator from the Show Me State as well. And on Tuesday, John Ashcroft was honored for his 10th anniversary at Regent University. I am so grateful that as he retired, from the Office of Attorney General that he graciously consented to come and be a distinguished professor at Regent University. And as our dean has pointed out, we had no conception. Not only is he a great politician, not only is he a servant of Missouri, not only can he sing country western music, but he's a tremendous teacher. And his students love him. And Pat, as chancellor, I know you've been thrilled to have someone with such a long and distinguished record of public service making a contribution to Region for the last decade. You can't believe uh, how thrilled we are to have him on the faculty. Ten years of teaching, and he, the students just love him. And he's a real people person. He has hundreds of them in for dinner. He and his lovely wife, Susan, they, they, uh, they entertain quite frequently. But he is a tremendous teacher, and the students love him. So that's one thing we have at Regent. We have a former attorney general as a distinguished professor. Plus, we have a former chief of naval operations, four-star admiral, as one of our distinguished professors. So Regent's got some pretty sharp people. And these guys love to teach. They really are good. So I, I honor John Ashcroft. We are delighted and honored that he would uh, consider uh, spending uh, quality time at Regent University teaching our students. Wendy. I had a chance to go to one of those parties that he had at yeah. his home with his wife, and he people don't know what a great pianist he is. He loves to sing, and he gets everybody around the piano. We had a great time. Oh, he loves to sing. His wife is, is, is not Susan, it's Janet. It's, it, it, mm -hmm. Yeah, but she, she's a great cook. They, they both are. Yeah, and, great cooks, and, oh, yeah. and we're so happy to have them. Well, yeah. What would cause a COO to leave his job and give his truck to a stranger he met at a donut shop? God just got a hold to my heart and said, I have something that I want you to do. And that something is starting the all in movement. We'll tell you more right after this.
Well, you're watching the 700 Club. We're so happy to have you with us. Our dear friend Wendy Griffith is here with us today. You have just returned from the islands. <laughs> The Bahamas. I bought you a T-shirt, Pat. <laughs> you did. Oh, that sounds nice. Anyhow, it was uh, wonder. It was wonderful. 80 degrees and sunny. But you and... were. I told people you were on assignment. I you... was on assignment, but you know what? It's okay to get tan for Jesus, mm. also. Walter Cronkite used to have a boat, a, a sailboat called Assignment. So when they would say, where's Walter? He's on assignment. <laughs> so we'll get you a yacht. Wendy's on assignment. <laughs> right. well, despite what you may hear in the media, America remains a deeply religious country. Around 80% of the American people say they are Christians. But how many of them live up to that claim? John Jessup introduces us to a man on a mission to encourage people to not only talk the talk, but to walk the walk of Christianity. Mike Phillips is a loving husband and a devoted dad. And not long ago, he was also a successful businessman, the chief operating officer of one of Louisiana's fastest growing high-tech firms. Then he took a leap of faith. God began to affirm me. He had me give my truck away to a stranger in a donut star parking lot. I was just going through life, um, doing the best I could. And then um, God just got a hold to my heart and said, I have something that I want you to do. With no income, financial support, or formal Bible training, he launched a Christian ministry challenging believers to fully walk with Christ, a mission that tested his own faith. He let me know, you're not all in. There's an area of your life that you have withheld from me. I was trusting in the provision he had given me instead of trusting in him as my provider. And those closest to him. It's one thing to be the person that God gave this vision to, and it's another thing to be that person's spouse. I thought I was faithful before, but now I know what it really means to be faithful. Mike's wife, Cherie, says they knew early on their lives wouldn't follow an ordinary track. Even on those tough days, you think about, we knew way back then that there was something else. Mike cashed in all of his company's stocks to fund his calling. He even gave away his truck to someone who needed it more all to reflect his renewed commitment. He believes if America's 230 million self-identifying Christians did their part, it would lead to national revival. Born and raised in the Bayou State, Mike Phillips is launching his all-in campaign from right here in Louisiana to mobilize Christians around the country to show the love of Jesus Christ to others. And he's tying it to a date on the calendar that he believes shows the ultimate example of love. What better way to introduce the country to an authentic Christian movement than by challenging them on Good Friday, the day that Christ served us, uh, to serve others and love others. And so we're just challenging Christians um, to get up that day and to find someone to love and to serve. It could be buying a cup of coffee. It could be um, going and searching for somebody whose car is broken down on the side of the road. He says there's no act too big or small. And when they're asked why, why are you doing this? Why are you serving? What are you doing? Um, the answer is simple. It's because I'm all in. I'm an authentic Christian and I'm serving because Jesus Christ served me. Things are starting to take shape. He's developed an app so Christians can share what they've done, upload videos, and keep track of their service. Several well-known athletes, performers, and government leaders back the campaign. What intrigued me about this is that sometimes Christians are known for what we're against. We're not known as much for what we're for. And when this concept came of, of doing good on Good Friday, I thought, what a great way to do something positive, uplifting, that actually helps people, does something charitable and kind. Uh, we need more of that. Who's with me? Mike's main message, authentic Christianity, is about making a difference in people's lives. When you're fully committed to Jesus Christ, He changes your heart and you can't help but love others. It becomes your purpose. It becomes what you're about. Um, but we don't see that going on. We see people living uh, selfishly. And church leaders agree. You look at the divorce rate, you look at people quitting their jobs, dropping out of school. Uh, people, they give up. They're not living all in. They're not fully committed to what they do. And the people who are fully committed, many of them are committed to the wrong things. Mike believes this all-in movement will change people's perception about Christianity. We'll be uh, white and black and, and old and young and Democrat and Republican and we'll span every Christian denomination and we won't agree on every issue. 
um, but we're held together by a common set of values and a single purpose, and that's to show the love of God to other people. Everybody have good day. John Jessup, CBN News, New Orleans, Louisiana. Well, for more information about Do Good Friday and how you can be involved, log on to our website at cbnnews.com. That's good, do good Friday. Wendy? Up next, a star is born and then typecast by Hollywood. They wanted girls in short, short skirts. They wanted the dumb blonde. Once they saw me, I walked in the room, they knew I was the girl. Sitcom star Terry Copley reveals a side of show business you won't see on TV after this. Terry Copley had the looks to be a star. That's why her face has graced the covers of TV Guide and Playboy. The young actress had no problem finding a job in Hollywood. Finding love, on the other hand, that came from a mysterious voice. In the early 80s, Terry Copley was known as the blonde bombshell that appeared in sitcoms like The Love Boat and We Got It Made. But underneath her beauty and confidence, Terry was just a girl who longed for the love of a father. Basically, my younger years, I was raised by a single mom. My relationship with my father as a child was um, pretty much nothing. I think the impact of not having a father and having a father that didn't really nurture me or really give me love had a huge um, significant impact in my life of rejection. Around 10 years old, Terry found acceptance in the home of a neighbor. Her name was Gwen, and she had a little Bible study. So she would take all the little latchkey kids from all around the neighborhood, and she would give us cookies, and she would give us orange juice. And I, I think that's what drew all the kids to her house. And then she started taking me to church. As a little girl, I had this just kind of innate love for the Lord, and I didn't understand it. But in her late teens, Terry's family moved, and she stopped thinking about spiritual things. Instead, she was drawn to another love, acting. Acting was an escape for me, but it was also a joy for me. I went out for the audition for We Got It Made, and they wanted girls in short, short skirts. They wanted the dumb blonde. The audition was, hi, are you still looking for a housekeeper? So I said, hi, are you still looking for a housekeeper? Because I was scared. And the whole room said, you're hired. They said, once they saw me, I walked in the room, they knew I was the girl. But after years of getting similar roles, Terry was tired of being typecast. I remember thinking, I want to be taken seriously. So I tried, I went to acting classes. I thought that would make me be taken seriously. And then um, I started to tell myself, you're not innocent. You're not an innocent young girl. You're not, that's not the way the world is. Grow up. Then I got an offer from Playboy to do a pictorial. It was wrong for me. It wasn't who I was, but I did it. That was the adult voice trying to be adult in this world. Terry also tried to find fulfillment in romantic relationships. She was married three times, but all of the marriages failed. I just believe that because of the spirit of rejection that was in my life, attracted men that would reject me. So it was painful, but I was the kind of person that could take the pain and say, hmm, I'll think about it tomorrow and go shopping. But in 1991, Terry reached a point where she could not push back her pain anymore. I was just going about being an actress, and but I was, I was empty inside. And one morning I was sleeping and I remember seeing the sun just coming through the window of the hotel room. And the voice said, isn't the sun beautiful? 
And I simply responded, yes, the sun is beautiful. That morning, Terry remembered the God she had met as a child. And I got on my knees in the hotel room and I said, Lord, you've given me this life and I've made a mess of it. Please take it back and please just let me serve you. The love I felt from Jesus just consumed me. It went to the very depths of me. Terry started going to church and reading her Bible. She also started turning down acting jobs that didn't align with her faith. She even refused her dream role of playing Marilyn Monroe. When I surrendered my life to the Lord, I changed. Not because I had to, but because I wanted to. Once Jesus came into my life, um, I felt like a newborn baby and I felt innocent again. There were some struggles of losing everything and losing the life, but feeling rejected and unloved all my life and then feeling a love from Jesus, I was willing to give up everything for that. Today, not only does Terry have a strong faith, but God has also restored her acting career. She has written and acted in several Christian plays and also stars in the new Pureplex film, Redeemed. I feel like I have a lot to give to people. It's not so much about me receiving, but it's how much I can give, how much love I can give to people, how, you know, it, it turns you from selfishness to selflessness. What God did for me was He took a young girl that never felt loved and loved her to the very core and showed her that I'm beautiful from the inside out. What an amazing story. What an amazing story. How many girls are there now, young women and uh, mature women, who've always been looking for the love of a father. They never had one. And there was an emptiness in their life. But you see, God is a father. That's the way he has been introduced to us by Jesus. He called him the father. He's the father, and the one up, up, among whom all families of earth are named. He is the one who created families. He is the original father. He is the father. And we're told the story of the prodigal son who had to return to the father's house. And the Bible says, when my mother and father reject me, the Lord will take me up. The Lord will be your father. He'll be your mother. He'll be your comforter. He'll be your husband. He'll be the one that you can rely on, a strong, loving figure who will never leave you nor forsake you. He won't cheat on you. He won't abuse you. He won't mistreat you. He won't demean you. His total being will be involved in making you the perfect person that He wants you to be. You can trust Him. You can rely on Him. The nice thing, you can relax in His presence because He loves you. Now, do you want that relationship? I know you may have had a lousy father. He may have left you and your mother alone. Uh, he may have molested you. He may have done a lot of terrible things. But God wants to be the perfect father, the one you can rely on. And so he says, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. So if you want that today, I want you to bow your head. I want you to pray with me. And I want you to let a loving Father come into your life. Will you do it? Right now. Pray this prayer. Lord God, I know that you are my Father. And I come to you as Father. And I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus who I know died for my sins. I receive Jesus as my Savior, and I receive you as my Father. I enter into your household now, Lord. 
I COME HOME TO THE FATHER'S HOUSE. TAKE ME, LORD, AND FROM THIS MOMENT ON, I WILL LIVE FOR YOU, AND I WILL SERVE YOU ALL THE DAYS OF MY LIFE. IF YOU PRAYED THAT PRAYER WITH ME, THE ANGELS OF HEAVEN ARE REJOICING RIGHT NOW, BECAUSE YOU'RE PART OF THE FAMILY OF GOD, AND YOU'LL BE REJOICING WITH HIM FOR ALL ETERNITY. Now, IF YOU WANT TO KNOW WHAT HAPPENED TO YOU JUST THEN, I HAVE SOMETHING THAT I DID A LITTLE WHILE AGO. IT'S CALLED A NEW DAY. IT'S 73 MINUTES ON A CD. TELL YOU WHAT JUST HAPPENED. IF ANYBODY'S IN CHRIST, HE'S A NEW CREATION. WE'LL TALK ABOUT THE LOVE OF THE FATHER. WE'LL TALK ABOUT WHAT HAPPENS IF YOU HAPPEN TO SLIP AWAY FROM WHAT YOU'VE DONE AND YOU COME BACK. TALKS ABOUT uh, THE SECOND COMING OF JESUS. TALKS ABOUT A LOT OF THINGS. I'LL GIVE THIS TO YOU, BUT IF YOU PRAYED WITH ME, I WANT YOU TO CALL RIGHT NOW. ONE OF THESE COUNSELORS ON THE PHONE, THEY LOVE YOU, AND THEY'RE HERE FOR YOU. THE TELEPHONE NUMBER IS AVAILABLE. IT'S 1-800-759-0700. JUST CALL AND SAY, LOOK, I PRAYED WITH PAT. I GAVE MY HEART TO THE LORD. AND I WANT YOU TO KNOW THAT I AM PART OF THE FATHER'S HOUSE. I'VE GOT A FATHER NOW WHO LOVES ME. 1-800-759-0700. Oh, 0700. Here's Wendy. Amen. Thanks, Pat. Still ahead, Pat's going to bring it on with your emails. Carlos says, do we have to tithe on our tax return? Your questions are coming up, so don't go away. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Alabama Supreme Court has put a halt to same sex marriage in that state. The justices are disagreeing with federal courts and ordering state probate judges to stop issuing marriage licenses to same sex couples. Six justices on the court ruled the U.S. Constitution doesn't alter the judge's duty to administer state law. Alabama law defines marriage as between one man and one woman only, and the justices say a federal court cannot tell them to change that. Four American missionaries detained in Venezuela last week are finally back at home in North Dakota. The missionaries from Bethel Evangelical Free Church in Devil's Lake were handing out medicine and hearing aids last Wednesday when they were detained. They were told they didn't have the required work visas, something that wasn't required in their last 14 years of missionary work in that country. They also learned Venezuela's president accused them of being spies. The missionaries say they hope to return to Venezuela someday. Remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Pat and Wendy are back with more of the 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. To see this week's most viewed stories, go to CBN.com. It's time to bring it on with your email questions, and we got some doozies for you today, right. Pat. Let's go for Carlos it. wants to know. By the way, you know what doozy? I, I finally learned yesterday what doozy comes from. Do you know where it comes from? <laughs> no. You know, it's a doozy. We, <laughs> well, yeah, what does it you mean? You use that term. Yeah, you know we just use it. Well, the most fashionable car that was made in, in the early days of cardom was called a Duesenberg. You're kidding me. No. And so to have a doozy <laughs> was to have the, the sharpest car. So you've got the sharpest... Sharpest a doozy. Okay. We got some we got some good questions. Some All right. doozies. So All right. I just clarify your your plan. Go <laughs> That's ahead. Awesome. Well, dear dear Pat, I understand the tithe is ten percent of the first fruits of our labor. Since we tithe all year long and give above our tithe, do we still tithe the tenth of our tax return from April fifteenth? I thought we fulfilled the tithe during the year. And since an inheritance is a gift from the parents, does that fall under the tithe requirements also? We want to do it right. Look, I want to explain something to you. God is not a Philadelphia accountant or lawyer. <laughs> and so he's not sitting there with a green eye shade trying to add up the debits and credits on your tax return. But you ask a question, all right, what is that return? Well, the return is how much money you have overpaid the government. But it's how much you've overpaid after you have already deducted your charitable contributions from your tax return because you're allowed 50% uh, deduction on most gifts, at least mm -hmm. cash and so forth. So your tax return, uh, your tax refund uh, should be after the, the uh, 
deduction for your gifts. So, you know, you asked me a question about it from an accounting standpoint. And then an inheritance, I think that's a little extra blessing that you should, uh, you, you want to give. You know, it's not you have to do that. We're not, we're not under the law. We don't have to do it. Uh, it's a question of out of our heart. You give out of the love you have for the Lord. You give gifts and offerings out of a love, a heart of love and gratitude to the Lord. And he says, you do that. Bring me the tithes and offerings and I'll bless you. Hmm. And he'll do it. Okay. All right. Well, Linda says, the Bible tells us Jesus and his disciples cast out demons. Are there still demons in the world as, as they were back then? I know there's evil, but have not heard anything regarding this. Uh, it's amazing that... Uh, uh, the devil is present, but he's got everybody thinking he's a myth, yeah. and uh, he's real. Demons are real. They're, they're, they're uh, angels that fell uh, when Satan rebelled against God, and they're in the world, and they're little demons out trying to destroy human beings. They hate people, and they're doing the will of their father, who is Satan. So are they there? Yes, there are. But, but... Most people don't know what a demon is like, and you get these people who are into demon casting out ministry, and it's a lot of hokum, and they can do a lot of, of psychological damage to people telling them they have demons. So I uh, just be careful. But yes, demons are real. I, I, the prayer I like is, Satan, I bind you and the forces of evil. And that takes care of demons. Right. I bind you, Satan, and the forces of evil and cast you out. That's it. Okay. What's All that? right. Binding and loosening. That's good. Right. Sheila writes, my parents believe that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one, as the Bible says. But my dad said that we will never see God. I say we will. Who is right? Uh, well, the Bible says we'll see Jesus. We'll be like him because we will see him as he is. But whether we ever see the uh, infinite uh, glory of God himself, uh, the Bible says no man has ever seen God, but the only begotten of the Father, uh, you know, he declares him and makes him known. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, if God, when we get to heaven, we will see the full glory of the Lord. If we saw him now, we'd die. Mm. We couldn't stand it. So, uh, you know, when Moses uh, was in the presence of God, uh, he, he, his face shone. He had to put a, a veil over his face because he was glowing. Uh, but uh, that's an esoteric question that I don't really know the full answer to. But it, the Bible does say, I can tell you what it says clearly, mm -hmm. we will be like him because we will see him as he is. But he's talking about Jesus. Sorry. Amen. Well, the viewer writes, Paul talks about us being in a race. What does he mean when he says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. First Corinthians, uh, King James. There. You know, sports were a big thing in the Roman world. Uh, they had prize fights. Uh, they had uh, chariot races. They had foot races. Uh, the marathon race was run in Greece. That's where the marathon came from. And uh, uh, all kinds of foot races. So uh, Paul says, I, I don't shadow box. I don't box as one beating the air, you know, because, I mean, they were used to boxing. Right. Uh, so he's using a sports analogy to say, look, they're all running, but one guy gets the prize. So run that you may obtain. Well, the prize is, is eternal life in Jesus Christ. And uh, he's not saying that one guy is going to get in, the rest of them are going to be left behind. He didn't say that. He's just saying, uh, the guy that uh, achieves and strives and runs hard wins a prize. And you strive that you might win the prize of the upper calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he's telling us. So don't make too much more of biblical analogies than that. That's what he's talking about. Did you okay. ever run, run track? I threw the shot. I, I didn't <laughs> run here. track, but I, I pitched the shot. I've got a grandson who... Uh, was the state champion on the discus uh, at, in prep school. Mm. Uh, he set his his record with the discus was, I think, nine feet farther than the school that he went to oh than, than the previous record. Wow, amazing! So he's throwing the discus in college, and I think maybe he was also throwing the hammer. They stopped the hammer throw. My father held the hammer throw record in Virginia for the longest kind of time. Well, who knew? I, but I didn't <laughs> run. No, I didn't run, but I, I but I did. 
pushed the shot. <laughs> I ran the mile and the 880. Did you? Did you really? So that was my thing. That, you know, I was dis more distance than sprinting. Good but for you. Anyway, we're out of time. I got to go. Up next, a farm girl who couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't even stand up to walk to go to the bathroom. I had to crawl there, crawl back. I could function sometimes. Others, I would just have to lay down and try to sleep it off. And this went on for more than 20 years until the day she was healed in an instant. Find out how it happened next. Vertigo, it's a classic Hitchcock film about a detective who got dizzy at tall heights. But for Becky Darrington, Vertigo is more than a movie. It's something she lived with for more than 20 years. Mornings are coffee first. Again, I have breakfast with my husband and we sit and chat. That's one of my favorite times of the day is the mornings with Bill. It is beautiful and I love it. I love being on the farm. Life on the farm wasn't always an idyllic place for Becky Darrington. She'd been dealing with vertigo off and on for 21 years. Her symptoms started in the late 80s. Some days were debilitating. Vertigo is when you get dizzy, lightheaded. I couldn't even stand up to walk to go to the bathroom. I had to crawl there, crawl back, and just get in bed. I could function sometimes. Others, I would just have to lay down and try to sleep it off. After three years of sporadic dizzy spells, Becky saw a doctor. I went to the doctor and she gave me some medication for the dizziness. It helped, but it put me to sleep. Totally put me under. She saw another doctor in 2008. It got worse as the years went on, and I just lived with it. Three years later, Becky was home doing her usual chores around the house. The 700 Club was on. I was at my dining room table folding towels, and Terry was on, and she was praying for other people that had, you know, ailments and sicknesses. Then Pat Robertson started praying. Somebody has problems with an ear, inner ear infection, you're dizzy. You you're, have a hard time with balance. Right now, God is just reaching into that inner ear. He is completely healing it. You are healed. Put your hand over the ear, wherever, or both your ears. In the name of Jesus, be made whole. I was in the middle of folding a towel, and when I had that thought, I could be healed from this. And I had a sensation from the top of my head that went all the way down my neck, my shoulders, to the middle of my body, it went all the way down to my feet. And I knew immediately that instance, the vertigo, it was gone at that point. It's been three years and no signs of vertigo. I 100% knew God had laid his hand upon me. I felt it. It was physical. It was beautiful. It's about what the Lord can do, what Jesus Christ can do in his timing. He is with us every day and loves us. Amen. He is with us every day. We've got some powerful answers to prayer yeah. here. Alessandra of Maton, or Matton, I think it's Maton, Illinois, developed severe pain and tingling in her feet. When she was watching the 700 Club, Pat, she heard you say, there is something about the balls of your feet that are hurting, and it's really painful to walk. Within 30 minutes, the pain went away, and Alessandra has been pain-free ever since. Well, Laurie, who lives in New Britain, Connecticut, lost vision in her eyes. The doctor said it was a buildup of plaque in the left carotid artery. She called for prayer, then she went back for more tests, and guess what? The plaque was gone, mm -hmm. vision was okay, and Laurie is, I'm sure, praising the Lord. Amen. Now, folks, God loves you. God's all-powerful. When Jesus was here on earth, he never turned anybody down. He made them sometimes push them a little bit, but he never said no. And he says yes to you. So Wendy and I are going to join hands, and we're going to ask God right now to touch you, and nothing's impossible. Right. Father, you, right now, we believe God in the name of Jesus. We ask for the touch of God in people's lives. There's a bowel obstruction that somebody's got, and it's uh, been very painful and dis, uh, you know, discomforting. In the name of Jesus, that whole thing is just opened up, and your bowels will be as they should in Jesus' name. 
there's a man and you're a janitor and you've been hurt on the job and you really need to go back to work. I don't know exactly what happened, but God is touching you right now. Just receive your healing in Jesus' name. Somebody, the left eye is cloudy, like it's milky, cloudy. It's, it, I don't know if it's a cataract or worse than a cataract, but right now, put your hand over the eye. God has just dissolved that problem, and you're going to get 20-20 vision in the name of Jesus. Someone with um, your big toe, your big toe is black and blue, and, and it really hurts, and you've just been crying out in pain. God has heard your prayers. He's touching you right now. Just receive it in Jesus' name. Now let the anointing come into people's lives. Yes. Unite families, Lord. Bring the financial blessing that people are praying for. Give them the answer to their prayer. In Jesus' name, thank you, amen. amen and amen. Well, I want to thank you for being with us on this edition of the 700 Club. We have today's Power Minute. It's come from Luke chapter 18. The things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Well, tomorrow we've got the great cholesterol myth. We'll show you what's the real cause of heart disease. We've been giving you some features on that, and you want to make sure you watch this feature because it'll tell you how to stay alive and healthy. So until then, for all of us, goodbye. God bless you.